Well, my grandfather once said when I, when I was very young that one day there'd be no more Indians. I didn't know what he meant then, but I know what he means now. It's the first time in 40 years that Alan Isfeld has been back to the land where his family's home once stood. Isfeld lived in a one-room hut with his grandparents and two younger brothers. It was a poor but happy existence, but on a summer day in 1955... Social workers came and got us here, took us away, me and my two brothers. And Eventually moved to Winnipeg and separated from his brothers, five-year-old Isfeld was a First Nations Canadian forced to live in a white man's society. As the only First Nations child in his school, he says, life became a fight for survival. We didn't know from day to day going to school whether you're going to have a fight on the way to school or a fight on the way back from school or a fight at school. According to the Canadian government, more than 11,000 Aboriginal children were forcibly removed from their families and adopted into predominantly white families during the so-called scoop. But the Aboriginal community believes the actual number is much higher. They say many adoption records were lost because thousands of children were sent to live with families in the United States, in states like Louisiana and Pennsylvania, and records were not kept. Look at these cute little native babies. They don't look, um, they almost look like they're white. So come on down and come and adopt our, um, our children. An adoptee herself, Colleen Rajat, is now a filmmaker who recently completed a series on little. First Nations children who were adopted into the U.S. during the 1960s and 70s. And Unfortunately, the more and more I talk to the adults who had been adopted to the U.S., every adult had a similar story of being adopted either to a home where there was abuse or they were treated as slaves. Physically and emotionally abused by their adoptive families, many of those children fled back to Canada. But with no money or prospects, an overwhelming number ended up on the streets or in jail. Elsie Flett runs Manitoba's First Nations Child Services. She says the adoption process impacts First Nations communities across Canada to this day. Kids are the future for any of us, certainly for uh, groups that are a minority in this country and that are struggling to protect culture, language, um, community and family. Losing children uh, is a pretty devastating thing. Flett says the government had provided some funds to help adoptees reunite with their families. But that money has since dried up, and little has been done to help since. Neither the feds or the province have really stepped up to the plate and taken ownership for, um, you know, some of the results of these policies. I've lost my culture. I've lost where I came from more than this vacant lot. You know, I've lost, uh, I've lost my ties to my community. I've lost my ties to my brothers and my sisters. Alan Isfeld wants Canadian First Nations people to be able to self-govern and determine who should be granted Indian status. He wants the Canadian government to apologize and fund programs to help First Nations people affected by the scoop. But Isfeld says no amount of money could ever make up for what his people have lost. If someone physically took a knife and cut your heart out, you would die. Well, that's what they did to our culture. They killed it. Though he has his own home and a loving wife and family now, all Alan Isfeld has of his past are scattered memories of a happy time torn apart at such a tender age. Rob Reynolds, Al Jazeera.